Today's reading comes from the 12th chapter of Mark. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenant to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. And so it was with many others. Some they beat, and others they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come. Let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the keystone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. When they realized what, that he had told a parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd, so they left him and went away. Then they sent to him some Pharisees and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me see it. And they brought one. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Jesus said to them, Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God, the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, grace to you and peace. Amen. A week ago, last Saturday, I swung into Target to pick up a few things that I needed for dinner. And as is our custom, I texted Anne to see if there was anything else that she knew we needed. She replied right away, toilet paper. <laughs> I had a feeling there might be a problem. We, when I made my way over to the disposables and paper products aisle, I was not surprised to discover a collection of near empty shelves. The pallet that usually houses our favorite brand was there, but there was nothing stacked on top of it. Fortunately, there were a few small packages of another brand, so I didn't have to leave empty-handed. As I headed toward the checkout, I began to contemplate just how long this supply would last and, and figured out that these few rolls would last us quite a while. So what's with all the panic buying going on? I understand not wanting to be stuck at home during a potential quarantine without any toilet paper, but a two-year supply? Really? Is that going to be necessary? I did a little research uh, on the thinking behind all this panic buying. According to Paul Marsden, a consumer psychologist, this curious behavior can be explained with the psychology of retail therapy, where we buy to manage our emotional state. It's about taking back control in a world where you feel out of control. Marsden was quoted in the article I read as one who's spent the last few days coordinating our efforts as Prince of Peace to respond to this rapidly changing world. I totally understand this desire to feel like we still have some control. In the parable
parable that Jesus shares in our reading today, the tenants have taken control of the vineyard and all of the fruit that's been harvested off of its vines. Jesus doesn't say why the grape growers have taken this action, only that they're not abiding by the terms of the arrangement they had with the vineyard owner. Usually I love the Bible stories that describe a vineyard setting, and there are many, but this parable is troublesome. I don't like the picture it paints and the parallels that it draws. God, of course, is the vineyard owner, while the tenants are the corrupt religious leaders. And that leaves the prophets to be the slaves that are sent, and sent again, often to their death, just as the son is. And who is the beloved son? In case we weren't paying attention, it's the storyteller himself, Jesus. And an angry God comes to destroy it all in the end. This vineyard is not such a happy place. We have to take note that our lectionary, to keep aligned with the liturgical calendar, has skipped over Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Don't worry, we'll revisit that bit again on Palm Sunday. But it should not be lost on us that this story is planted between this high point of celebrating Jesus for his proclaimed messianic identity and the loads of being arrested for the same. Once again, Jesus predicts his coming death and now places it squarely into the hands of the very people who should be celebrating his arrival but are too afraid of the changes he represents. God has sent his son to participate in the harvest, and the religious leaders won't let go of any of it. And we are left to wonder why. In my research on the behavior of panic buying, another psychologist wrote, when people are stressed, their reason is hampered. So they look at what other people are doing. If others are stockpiling, it leads you to engage in the same behavior. People see photos of empty shelves, and regardless of whether it's rational, it sends a signal to them that it's the thing to do. The Pharisees that controlled the religious establishment in Jerusalem were clearly under the thumb of the occupying Roman authorities and maintaining control of the temple in cahoots with Herod's puppet government. They had a vested interest in keeping things just the way they were, and there was no value to them in opening a path for this outsider from Nazareth to share in what was being reaped. And Jesus wasn't exactly willing to play their game. Jesus' parable puts the abundance of God's vineyard squarely up against the religious leaders' fear of scarcity. They cling tightly to whatever power they might have and work hard to repeal any threat, even if it means killing the one who comes to make a claim and counter the status quo. But as we read over and over again, God's vision for the world isn't defined by a vineyard occupied by scared tenants that hoard the harvest in a panicked response to a threat. God's vision is for a world that shares its abundance so that all might thrive. How very fitting for us today as we are clearly under threat, worshiping together but mediated by a video screen. We are confronted with the question now of how to respond. Will we hoard God's abundance in a panic, 
Or will we share in God's vision and make sure there will be enough for us all? And to be clear, I'm not just talking about toilet paper. In the midst of all the uncertainty and rapidly changing conditions around us, I'm heartened to be reminded of all the good that God is doing. Just a week ago, we shared the first half of our tithe from the Rose Diesler estate gift when we handed a check for $38,000 to the CEO of Keystone Community Services. I have little doubt that they will put that money to work quickly in caring for our neighbors, some who now face greater challenge and risks in light of this growing public health crisis. I'm also heartened when I read about Lincoln, Nebraska's Concordia College senior, Grace Berry, who wrote this in response to learning that her basketball season had come to a premature end. As a senior playing in the NAIA National Tournament, I am heartbroken that I will never play another collegiate basketball game due to the hysteria of the coronavirus. I would do anything to finish out the national tournament and play just one more game with my teammates, my family. I'm not an expert on the coronavirus, nor I would claim to be, and I do not promote the decision made by the NAIA. However, if we prevent just one person from dying, if by canceling the women's basketball national tournament, we prevent one person from losing their sister, daughter, mother, father, or son, that is a success itself. So congratulations to all 32 teams at the national tournament. Not only do you all share collectively in the 2020 NAIA national title, but you won something even greater. You sacrificed for the greater good of all people. <laughs> and I am heartened when I read of the efforts being mobilized by our partners at Sheridan's Story, who are responding to the likely reality that thousands of food insecure students will now be kept home from school in the coming days and weeks. Away from the school, they won't be getting fed breakfast and lunch as they usually do during the week. Sheridan's Story is ramping up its efforts and finding ways to distribute even more food in a time such as this. Know that we are looking at how Prince of Peace can best support their work in this time. So it turns out, it's not about us. It can't be. In the face of this uncertain and unsettling threat, we are being called to share the harvest. We need to care for our neighbors. We need to care for our family. We need to care for our community. This is how we will best be able to care for ourselves. And hopefully, very few of us will have to do without the medical care or the food or even the toilet paper that we need. Thanks be to God. Amen.